I bring greetings to those of you who are watching by DVD and to all of you who are in the classroom with us as we continue our study on spiritual gifts. This is session 26 and we will be studying today the spiritual gift of intercession. The last time we talked about the spiritual gift of interpretation and we mentioned that both tongues and interpretation as well as later healings and miracles are very controversial gifts in the body of Christ and our plea was for all members of the body to be united and not divided over these gifts and to recognize that everyone uh, worships God in their own way. Interpretation is the gift where God empowers a person to understand and give a message to a church that God has given to a person speaking in tongues. There was a man in England in 1836 named George Muller. He's quite a well-known individual because he was a prayer warrior. He started an English orphanage for homeless children. And when he passed away, they found his prayer journal. It was over 300 pages long, and there were 30,000 prayer requests that were listed, many that had been answered in the most amazing ways. And I'll just tell you one story. There was a night when the children went to bed and George Muller knew there was no bread for breakfast for the children. He couldn't sleep. He got down on his knees and he prayed and he asked God, please God, provide bread so our children will not go hungry. At three o'clock in the morning, a local baker called George Muller at the door. There were no telephones and said, I can't sleep. So I got up to bake bread and I wondered, would your children like some bread for the morning? These types of things happened to George Muller over and over again. And it's clear that George Muller had the gift of intercession. Many of you who are in this room, many of you who are watching by DVD, may also have the gift of interpretation. Let's find out a little bit more about it, and as you hear about it, please apply it to your own life and try to understand, is this a gift that God works through you by answering prayer? Now, in all of the other spiritual gifts that we have studied thus far, they've been listed either in 1 Corinthians 12 or in Romans 12. This is a gift that's not listed there. And so I would ask you in the classroom, those of you watching by DVD, please open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we will see where the gift of intercession is mentioned in a different way. So those of you in the classroom, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we will take a look at a passage that presents this gift in quite a different way. Now in the beginning part, Paul has first brought his greetings and then he's talked about how God brings comfort to us so that we can give comfort to other people and that God is the God of all comfort and that sometimes these trials and, and problems are given to us so that we will learn endurance as we suffer and that we should remain firm in our hope that God will carry us through these sufferings. And then he continues in verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us, as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Let me give a little background to what's happened. Paul and his colleagues while they've been on their missionary journey, have experienced extraordinary pressure. They've even thought that they were going to die. Uh, the pressure was so great that they thought all was lost. And yet God came alongside them, protected them, delivered them, and he expresses the confidence that God not only has delivered them, 
he will continue to deliver them as the uh, Corinthians continue to pray for him. And look down at verse 9 because this is the key verse. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. The phrase gracious favor is translated in the English as charisma. This is always associated with a spiritual gift. If that word does not appear, then it is not a spiritual gift. It is a natural ability. But as it talks about prayer, in fact, as it talks about the plural, the prayers of many, it is associated with this term charisma, which in fact is the, the sign that it is a spiritual gift. So intercession by many is believed not to be a gift because it's not listed in the main passages. Here we see that it is linked with the gift of praying. It's also interesting that if you look at verse 9, uh, verse 11, it says, then many will give thanks. And then at the very end, it says, in answer to the prayers of many. It doesn't say, in answer to the pr prayers of all of you. Paul often would talk about, thank you all for, thank you for, meaning everyone. Here, he just says, the prayers of many. Jesus, when he talks about salvation, he says, and to give his life as a sacrifice for sin for many, not for all. I believe that as he's talking here, he no knows that everybody's been praying for him. But he believes that those with the spiritual gift of intercession have been used of God through the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver them to bring them uh, safely through an incredible time that they've had in the province of Asia. Intercession, whether or not you believe it's a gift, we know from personal experience there are many people in the body of Christ whom we would call prayer warriors. There's something about these people that just love to pray. And the prayer of the righteous man will accomplish accomplish much. And we see how George Muller was a man of prayer. We see how the Corinthians were people of prayer. And we see how God answered George Muller's prayer, provided bread. And we see how God answered the prayer of many in, Corinth, in the Corinthian church in order to bring Paul and his colleagues safely through a very difficult time. It's also interesting that in this passage, the word delivered us is used three times. If we go back, we'll say that they were in distress and that they were even thinking that they would die. But he says, he has delivered us. Then he says, he will deliver us. And then he talks about, he will continue to deliver us. Three times. And each of those is in a different phase. It's in the past, he's delivered us. It's in the present, he is delivering us. It's in the future, he will deliver us. There's a confidence that throughout our lives, whatever our circumstances, whether they be good or difficult, God will deliver us, he'll carry us through. All right, let's, let's take a look at, as we have at the Greek word. Uh, of prayers. We're also going to look briefly at the Greek term for many. This is, of course, a, a seminary course, and we'd ask those of you who are seminary students to please also use your Strong's Concordance. Look at these words yourself, understand what they mean in the Greek, for Paul did not write in English, Paul did not write in Russian, he did not write in your language, he wrote in ancient Greek. And so understanding this is very important. Paul uses the word deasis, deasis, to mean prayer. It is G 1162. And it is the word that means to seek, to ask, to entreat, 
to beg God to do something. And it's never used in the context of asking for something for yourself. So many times my prayers, and perhaps yours, are of the, Oh Lord, please give me. Oh Lord, do this for me. Oh Lord, do that for me. In fact, if the truth were told, that's what my prayer life consists of most of the time. I have told you in previous sessions, prayer is, is a part of my Christian walk that is a challenge for me. And I pray that God would continue to work in my life so that I could become more of a man of prayer. And I have a feeling there's many of you out there who would nod your heads and say, this is a difficult discipline for you as well. But those of you with the gift of intercession, you can't relate to what I'm saying because there is joy in your prayer. And you bring prayers on behalf of others. It's almost as if you put yourself last. In English, we have a, a phrase that we use, which is an acronym. That means the first letter of each word stands for something. And we say that when you are in Christ, there is joy. There is Jesus first, J, other second, O, yourself last, Y. You put Jesus first in your prayers, you pray for others, and then you pray for yourself. And I think that people with the gift of intercession understand that prayer as a prayer warrior is meant for others. Let's go down then and look at the other term, because I mentioned that this idea of many, I believe, just refers to those with the gift of intercession. And in the Greek, the term many means palus, palus, and that is G4184. It does mean many, sometimes it means much, sometimes it means very large. And I believe that in the Corinthian church there were a large number of prayer warriors who were praying and helping uh, Paul through their prayers and others to be able to continue preaching the gospel. And then we come to the term gracious favor, which in the English is charisma. The idea that there is something special about this person. We don't quite understand it. That individual has charisma. We're drawn to it. And it, is, it stands over and above other people and the way they present themselves. Now, in the Greek, it is not pronounced charisma. It is pronounced in the way that the uh, Jewish people often do with a hard ch. <sighs> All right? It is pronounced charisma. Charisma. J5486. It is sometimes used as the idea of a um, gift given to you for which you have not merited. None of us have received salvation because we deserved it. It was charisma. It was God's gracious gift to us. But I don't believe that it means that here because there's a second meaning of the word charisma. It is a gift denoting extraordinary, supernatural power from the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's what's being referred to here, that many people were praying. Those people had the gift of intercession, and because of that, God empowered them to shower charisma on Paul and on his brothers. It is always a term that's associated with spiritual gifts. If you do not find it, it is not a spiritual gift. When we go back to Romans 12, when we go to 1 Corinthians 12, and the other passage we have not yet looked at in 1 Peter chapter 4, as well as Ephesians 4, the term in English, charisma, is always used. Now the definition that we're going to use for charisma is very simple. In fact, all of these definitions I have tried to make as simple as can be. To pray frequently and passionately. 
Frequently, they pray often. Passionately, they pray with energy, with enthusiasm, with excitement. And the uh, purpose of prayer in the church is to bring before God the needs of others. And we've talked about these serving several roles in the church. Founding the church, instructing the church, caring for the church, managing the church, as well as bringing a special message to the church. This role, honestly, sincerely, is caring for the church. It is bringing the needs of others before God. I looked to the commentators and frankly, no one agrees with my position. So I would like you to recognize I am not a Greek scholar. In fact, I have admitted at the very start, I have not gone to Bible college, I have not gone to seminary. I am a lay person called of God to do this ministry to teach about spiritual gifts so people will know their role. But as I've studied this, I'm quite convinced that my interpretation is just as valid as some of the other interpretations that commentators have, get, have given. I ran a word search in, uh, online to find every time the word charisma was used in the New Testament. And this is the only time that that word appears linked to another gift that's not in a list. And I do believe that this was a special situation where God was trying to emphasize there is a gift. There's a gift of prayer, of interceding on the behalf of others. And I know that there are others who would disagree with me. That's the beauty of commentating. Everybody has their own opinion. This is mine, and I believe that it does make sense because the word charisma is there, and immediately after that, is the word prayers. Let's talk a little bit about prayer warriors. I know many people who I would say they're prayer warriors. What are some of the characteristics of a prayer warrior? What sets apart the people who pray, pray often, pray with passion? Is there something that's unique about them that perhaps lacks in the life of all of us who are to pray, but we don't see God often work through us in supernatural ways. Would you open your Bible, uh, please, to Luke chapter 22, and we will begin at verse 41. This is a very familiar passage. It is Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he soon will be arrested, he soon will go to the cross and die, and three days later be uh, resurrected. So it says that Jesus went out, in verse 39, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Notice it says, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. And on reaching the place, the place, there was a place that Jesus typically went to. He said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He already knew they were going to fall asleep. But he was saying, please pray that you won't fall into that temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw. I don't know how far that is, so let's just take it literally. Taking a stone and he threw it. That's how far away he went. He, stone's throw beyond them, he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. There is some physical evidence that a person can be in such an emotional state of anguish that literally they, instead of sweat pouring down, blood comes from the pores. This has been verified by science. But what I'm trying to say here is, I emphasize the word, he was in anguish and he was praying more earnestly. I believe these are terms that really help us describe the characteristics of a prayer warrior. They're in anguish. 
They're praying more fervently, more earnestly than perhaps those of us who pray. When I pray, I've never had sweats of blood come from my skin. I've never honestly been tortured in my soul and prayed with anguish. I am not a prayer warrior, but people I know who are say that they feel in this state of literal pain as they present the needs of the body, especially when it's a very difficult situation. So, there is other examples of the same word being used so that you see it's not a one-time mention of this term. Let's turn to Acts chapter 12. We're just going to look at verse 5 and then we're going to look at verse 12. Peter is in prison. He's been arrested uh, for preaching the gospel, uh, confronting the Sanhedrin, and now he's in jail. And so in verse 5 it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Certainly among those in the church were those with this gift. And down in verse 12, knowing that they've prayed earnestly, here comes the answer. When this had uh, dawned on them, meaning that the gates in prison had mysteriously opened and they were free, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, John Mark, the person who wrote the book of Mark, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the door. A servant woman, girl named Rhoda, came to the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. People prayed earnestly and the answer to prayer came. And Rhoda was so excited that the answer was there. She forgot to let Peter in. She goes back to tell everybody else, he's here, he's here. Peter's still outside the door. Yeah, so she's excited. Then one last time, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we will look at uh, verse 10 here, where one last time this phrase uh, is used. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul is talking about praying, he praying for the Thessalonians. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. We will pray for you night and day more earnestly. There's actually two characteristics listed here that I think are correlated with the gift of intercession. One is what we've been talking about. It would be more earnestly, but the second is ongoing. He says night and day, night and day. Let's go and see that one other place in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul often has a way of starting his messages uh, the same way. You may wonder, why does Paul start with Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and all of these other people? It's because that was the custom of the time. When we write a letter, which we don't do anymore because of email, but when we write a letter, we usually put the greetings at the end of the letter. In Roman times, they put the greetings right up front. So that's why it starts. Uh, Most of them start that way. So let's look at uh, Colossians 1. We'll go down to verse 9. And talking to the Colossians, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul was a prayer warrior. He prayed constantly. When you look at his uh, epistles, over and over and over and over again, he talks about, we're praying for you, we're praying for you. We haven't stopped praying for you. This is the mark, the distinctive characteristic of someone with the gift of intercession. And then we're going to just look at one other verse. If you would come down to the same book, Colossians 4, and go down to verse 12. I think there's a wonderful example of a person with the gift of intercession. Colossians 4, and we're looking at verse 12. 
And listen to this. Epaphras, who was one of Paul's closest associates, in fact, they were in jail together at one point. Epaphras, who is one of you from Colossae, uh, uh, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Always wrestling in prayer. Think back to the Old Testament. We're not going to go there. You know the story. Jacob is out and he is praying and down from heaven comes a ladder and he sees the angels going up and down and suddenly the man is there and wrestles with him. This is the picture of wrestling in prayer. And Jacob will not let go of the man. It's becoming daylight. And the man, who is some Old Testament uh, appearance of Jesus, says, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so the man blesses him, but he does one other thing. He dislocates his hip and Jacob walked with a limp forevermore. I think there's the, em the emphasis is on his prayer and I won't let you go until you answer my prayer. That's the person with the gift of intercession. But also notice this is a message for all of us. When we're serious about walking with Jesus, when we want him and him alone, when our hearts say, I will not rest until I become more and more full of Jesus Christ. We walk with a limp. We bear the sufferings of Jesus. Now we don't literally have a limp. We have something that becomes a burden for us. Many believe that Paul had poor eyesight and this is why he had so many people who were scribes writing for him instead of him writing himself. That was his limp. You have a limp somewhere. Could be physical, could be mental, emotional, relational. Somewhere in your life there is pain and that pain is ongoing. Or it is something that uh, makes it difficult for you to minister, but it also in your weakness allows you to experience the strength of God. For when we are weak, then we are strong. And I think God gives us this limp so that we will not depend on ourselves. We'll have to turn to him. And Jacob is a wonderful example of a prayer warrior. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. One final example, and I'll just mention this. You know the story of Nehemiah. By the way, those of you with the gift of leadership, the book of Nehemiah is your book. Nehemiah is the most wonderful study on the gift of leadership ever written. And you can find countless principles in Nehemiah's life that you could apply to your life. But in terms of his gift of intercession, in the beginning, he's in his home and here comes his brothers, some believe literal brothers, to visit him. He's in Babylon. They have come from Jerusalem and Paul says, I have been praying for the people of Jerusalem. How is it in Jerusalem? They bring a terrible report. The walls are broken down. The city is in, you know, disarray. It is really not a good situation. And what happens to Nehemiah? Immediately is crushed in spirit. Immediately he begins to fast and to pray because he is praying for the needs of Jerusalem. Little did he know that God was going to call him to go and take care of the broken down wall. He was a prayer warrior. Often a prayer warrior hears of a pr prayer need, immediately is crushed in their spirit. And sometimes God calls them 
to take care of the problem that they're praying about. Not always, but sometime. My mom, whom I've talked about before, had the gift of intercession. She's now with the Lord and I miss her dearly because she prayed for me constantly. And I knew she was praying and it, and it really was a source of comfort and strength for me. But my mom, when you looked at her face, you saw Jesus. Do you know people in your lives that when you look at them, you say, I can see Jesus in them. There's something about their face. It glows. It's like Moses when he went up and he got the Ten Commandments and he came down. The people said, oh my, your face is glowing. Because he had been in the presence of God. And Moses put a veil over his face because he did not want to have the people to see the, the face stop glowing. But the important point is, when you have been in the presence of God, your face changes. I believe that the people who you look at and you say, they look like Jesus. There's something about them. They're prayer warriors. They have been in the presence of Jesus, praying for you, praying for me, praying for the needs of others. And God, in His holiness, in His majesty, you cannot help but begin to look majestic and holy yourself. Not because of who you are, but you've been in the presence of God. So I have some questions for you, as I have had previously. And I ask you, please, ask these questions of yourself. And if one or more of them seem to be a yes, then please consider you may have the gift of intercession yourself. Here are the questions. Has God worked through you too? One, think about praying for someone as soon as you become aware of the need. In other words, your first reaction is, I should pray about that. That's a good indication you may have the gift of intercession. Number two, as God worked through you to set aside large blocks of time in order to pray in private. Prayer warriors don't just pray like I do for about two minutes, three minutes. They pray for hours. And when they're done praying, it seems like it was two minutes because they love to pray. And after all, for them, they are right in the presence of Jesus, right at the throne of grace. And the third thing, has God worked through you to, while praying, feel deep, sympathetic feelings for those that you're praying for? You are in anguish. You feel the pain that people feel, and you are in anguish. The gift of intercession is a wonderful gift that benefits the body of Christ by allowing people with the gift of intercession through the Holy Spirit, where in Romans it says, we do not know how to pray ourselves. So the Spirit takes what we pray, translates it into the language of heaven, and God answers the prayer. Join us next time as we'll continue our study. We have now finished our study of those gifts associated with the mouth, and we will move on to those associated with the heart. Thank you for joining us.